the first question I saw was, I believe this was during uh, Ekram's presentation, Kurt asked, to help reduce soil disturbance and soil erosion, we have farmers who use low disturbance manure injection system. Has there been any study looking at how different types of injection attachments affect soil compaction and how low disturbance versus high disturbance injection systems affect it? So uh, I'm not aware if currently there is any work in, in Wisconsin about the um, disturbance effect of injection system, but I know there is an extension specialist, Francisco Arriaga from Wisconsin, that he is working on those kind of uh, injection systems or different disturbance levels. And the Wisconsin work was from his lab too. So, but I am not aware of current works if, if there's anything going on around there. Yeah, I, I would concur with uh, Ekram there. You know, I'm not aware of, uh, of a study off the top of my head, but I know that there is uh, perhaps some uh, uh, analog studies that um, one could use to uh, suggest whether or not a, a high disturbance or low disturbance would be uh, influential. And I'm kind of thinking of the strip till world there, you know, there's a, there are studies on as you go from like a strip till implement, whether it's using a coulter or if it's angled or you're using a shank or system or something like that on the chances for compactions, particularly in the sidewalls of where the slots being made. And that's where I think there's an analog there, perhaps with the uh, manure injection area. And that really comes more down to the timing again. If you go out and you uh, are using something that's injecting or, or doing a precision tillage like a strip till and it's a little bit too wet, one of the things to look for is whether or not when you cut through it, does that sidewall look shiny afterwards? Now, if you're injecting liquid manure, it's going to look shiny, but it's a... Uh, um, but what you're looking for is whether or not that sidewall is slicked over, it's smeared over. If you smear over a sidewall from at least the tillage world, we you can pretty much expect a 10-15% uh, drop in that next year's yield because of that sidewall compaction that occurs. Just, just want to follow that in case the question is from the coastal plain areas. Definitely any kind of disturbing has a significant effect, but if you put the manure in like sandy soils, which goes to 24 inches deep, and then we have a hard pan, manure impact or injection impact could be quite limited in, in those areas. Just in case, if question is from coastal plain. Betsy asked, what impact of injection rate on disturbance fracture or lift? And so the rate of the manure, is there an impact on that? on the compaction rate rate of manure will will for sure impact the compaction because you are adding different amount of organic matter basically in the system right because manure has a lot of organic matter but any study that has different rate of manure application and different rate of disturbance not sure that that could be a big work <laughs> all right and i'm not i'm this i know was during um Ekrem's Presentation. Brian asked, "Was the manure put on every year for 14 years during that study?" Yes. All right. Well, that you was have an a easy lot of one. manure in South Dakota. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, and then Dan asks, uh, "I was interested to see if this is for both of you. Uh, could you give any insight into tanks versus dragline, knowing that spo both can be heavy?" But with tanks, you often see that repeated loading going over the headlands. Um, so is there an effect from that repeated traffic versus not? Yeah, you know, it's uh, if you're out on the field and there's compaction that is occurring, but yet your logistics are, uh, have got you kind of constrained where you don't have much options other than endure that compaction event. If you repeatedly drive over the same spot, it's 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 not as bad um, uh, in itself, you know, in one sense, because 70 to 85 percent of all the compaction will occur during the first pass that goes through it. If you follow in the exact same lines, then it won't be as bad. But if you're reloading, you can drive in the same lines, perhaps. But as you're going out on the field, uh, then those new line of traffics is where the compaction will be at. Um, so the, the more repeated traffic you have, the more odds there are 
uh, unless you're doing some kind of controlled uh, traffic operation that's out there. And that's more of a controlled traffic from one year to the next year um, uh, kind of an issue, logistical issue that one has to consider. Yep. I, I would equal that for the coastal plain or east coast side. And also first pass, most of the compaction happens and uh, also consider the variability in soil type in, in that area. So that's, that's another factor to keep in mind because some soil types may keep the moisture longer than others. So it's good to have those information on hands for deciding any, any management practices around there. Yeah, when Aaron and I met last week and I saw his presentation, that was one of the questions that came to mind for me was, is the, is the precision world figuring out that we should keep our our manure application on the same in the same rows as what the har harvest what the combine goes in uh, you know like is precision there yet it's not i don't think it is i don't think a lot of us think about that uh, most of the time but if we can somehow align those things so that we were always following that same gps track for those of us that are using gps we could reduce compaction on large portions of our fields would be something cool to do. Yeah, I agree. You know, the, the GPS systems certainly give the avenue towards that. One of the difficulties is that so many machines are sold on different wheelbases and different loads, and then you have different tire inflations and flotation and tires, things that have different whips on it. So that adds that variety, that options in so many different machines out there uh, create a, a it's nice to have options, but it does create a challenge for taking it to the next step to be able to leverage the GPS technologies if you have it on your uh, machines to be able to uh, do more of a controlled traffic situation. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So avoiding going into there one less time is, is actually more effective than we, we can imagine. And since we have a lot of technology development, can we avoid any of those activities and using technology, maybe different type of equipment to do? Yeah. Or maybe wider equipments, maybe different equipments they don't really drive on, like fertility or, or spraying something, but we could be taught as well. And one other thing I'll mention to Dan, since he had the questions about tanks versus drag lines, it, it's uh, uh, depending, well, I'll put it this way, if axle loads are up above, or if the axle loads are really high, so if we're talking, you know, um, 15, 20 plus uh, axle loads, it really doesn't matter one way or the other. That's your chances of wheel traffic compaction is gonna be high for both. But if you can get one of them down below, um, you know, that 10 tons per acre, 10, 10, 10 tons per axle uh, uh, loads uh, in that range, then you have opportunities to maybe make a choice in between one or the other. And the choice really comes down to what is uh, the axle loads with that drag line on and how much area is that going to cover versus when you run a tank and when it's full and it's at its highest axle loads, by the time it unloads a portion of the product into the field and you're down into more friendly axle loads, how much uh, area did that cover? So it's more about area of cover. Uh, that question comes to on the trade-offs of tanks versus drag lines. But if you don't have low axle loads to begin with, uh, then both of them are going to be uh, uh, pretty high, I think. All right. So there's a couple other questions I want to get to, but Dan has a good question that, um, that feeds right off of that is, what about drag lines taking that 45 degree angle to the crop row uh, versus the following with the row? Does that How's that change things? You know, this this kind of goes into that uh, directly into that controlled traffic kind of idea. You know, if you're if you're planting on similar plant rows uh, uh, directions each year, then uh, and you have control over you have a GPS system, you have uh, the ability to travel in the same spots each year uh, when you're putting it out. I'd say go along with those uh, plant rows for it. Uh, especially if you're at high axle load. So if you've got a manure tank that's over 7,200 gallons and you're pushing 20 ton plus axle loads on it, driving in that same spot, you're just, you're acknowledging that you're going to take a yield consequence in that particular zone, but it's going to be isolated to that. 
if you're running at high axle loads and you go 45 degree angles to it, you're actually now spreading probably more compaction over the fields because you're running at a different uh, uh, track paths than what your combine and planter are. Uh, and based on their, um, the conditions, the moisture conditions of whether or not it was going to be high compaction risk or not. Uh, since most of the compaction is happening on the first pass, I would try to avoid distributing the defector on the field. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so Kitty asks, how about frost tillage? And I know you hit on this a little bit, Aaron, during your presentation. I just, I, I'm assuming that I'm understanding what frost tillage means, that um, compaction relief from freeze thaw, I believe is what she's getting at. Um, is there evidence of that being a, a durable way of, of decreasing compaction? Oh, uh, you know, uh, well, one, you know, tillage, so frost usually breaks up just so surface soils, uh, uh, compaction with it. It doesn't really get to the deep stuff on there. But if frost tillage, you know, get it when it when you're starting to till at the time of the year to where frost has either just occurred or it's just starting to set on um then that's actually pretty harsh on the uh, on the uh, the shanks and cultures or whatever your tillage system that's set up it's a lot of stress and you'll wear down the lifespan of your uh, implement uh, by running into frost uh, soils now that that may vary a little bit based on where you're at from where I was at uh, for nine years in uh, uh, Fargo, North Dakota, you'll, you'll tear up some equipment uh, going in when the ground's frozen, if you can even get it in in the first place. But another thing too is that uh, if you do get some warm periods during the winter um, and you've had a thick snow cover since early winter, the soils actually may be very prone to additional compaction by even driving out on them because that frost layer may not be very deep and when you get out towards the middle of the field, uh, you may just suddenly bury up to the axle. And we've seen that in fields actually, not on tillage wise, but on uh, trying to get in and do some winter harvest when wet conditions were in the fall uh, and crops were overwintering. And so you're now in a spot where you either winter harvest or spring harvest and you're balancing the odds of whether or not you're going into preventative plant for that next year. Uh, we've seen tractors get out or combines get out in February when snow went in early and they, they create more compaction that's out there and they actually bury themselves up to the axles and it's kind of a mess. So doing things in the winter is, is a bit of a gamble in itself too, both for equipment wear and tear and accomplishing what you're uh, aiming at. And for the, for the East Coast part, most of the tillage is, uh, compaction is happening in the hard pan, which is quite deep. So it requires some deep tillage, but I would try to avoid the surface tillage because we have quite a bit strong wind in the East Coast. So it can cause a lot of erosion, wind erosion in the system if we don't have a good structure soils on the surface. And most of the tillage is needed quite deeper in the, in the profile. So I'm not sure if the surface tillage would help that much with the compaction in the East Coast. All right. Uh, Kurt asks, Aaron, you mentioned proper tire pressure when driving on the road as compared to when in the field. So he's asking, so you're saying that the farmer should take time to deflate his tires uh, or her tires to 15 when they get into the field and then reinflate when leaving the field, correct? That's, that's, uh, that's correct. If you want to use the tire technology the way for what you're paying for. Now that's another logistical aspect of it. It takes time to deflate. It takes time to reinflate. You know, you could be looking at half an hour, hour to mm -hmm. uh, deflate, reinflate. Now, if you drive out on the road at 15 PSI, you're going to have to drive pretty slow because if you drive at a higher speed, you'll blow out the sidewalls. But at the same time, you know, when you're out in the field and you're running at 40, 50 PSI, you're pushing compaction uh, pretty deep and it's going to, you know, your chance of ruts and really cutting down on uh, the efficiency and traction in your field is there too. So it is a trade-off. It's a logistical time trade-off. There's auto inflation systems, but that's the times that it takes to do those auto inflation. Uh, you know, it could take you half an hour to an hour to deflate, reinflate when you go in and out of a field for it. 
So as a consideration, uh, the technology exists out there for a lot of uh, uh, equipment and setups. And at least compared to the, uh, uh, the tractor uh, uh, cost, you know, you throw another five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars into a pretty nice uh, auto inflation system. It's a it's a low cost compared to the overall capital cost, but it's uh, that technology does exist. But it's a logistical question uh, back to it. And that's actually the reason why I pointed out earlier in my presentation the difference in between tires, properly inflated, and tracks. Usually if someone sees a benefit by switching the tracks on their implement, it's, it's more probably of a sign that uh, they weren't using the radial tire technology the way that it was intended by dropping the pressure in the fields. So that's the benefit of the tracks. The tracks don't perform any better than a properly inflated tire, but it cuts out the logistics side of it. All right, thanks so much. Um, Mark asks, how much does a full drag line add to the axle weight? Do either of you know that? Not off the top of my head. Uh, <laughs> the bigger, the more it's going to add to it. But, you know, I, I don't, uh, um, I'll put it this way. Uh, not knowing a number off the top of my head, I can tell you that, uh, um, for instance, when you run a, a, a let's just say a typical size uh, a chisel plow behind a tractor, you're probably adding 25% additional load uh, on the back axle uh, from that weight transfer to the hitch. So that'll get you a ballpark idea for a drag line, perhaps. All right. And then Kurt says, here in Wisconsin, we had snow that melted by early February and then temperatures that reached 50 and 60 degrees and no frost in the ground. Farmers were applying manure and doing tillage. He's wondering whether they were doing more harm than good at that point. At that point, um, and he then proposes that maybe the answer is it depends, which is the perfect extension answer, uh, as far as I can tell. So go ahead, you got a response. <laughs> one of the most common answer, and I fully agree, it depends. But for specifically in Wisconsin, I would be more worried about water quality issues than than anything else because uh, it's going to be washed out and go into the water bodies and uh, focusing the compaction yes it depends right yeah you know my my thought on that and this is something that we we often say uh, up north on on high clay clay rich soils and these uh, uh silty clay soils is if in the springtime particularly if you're getting out there with tillage with the idea of warming up and drying down the soil almost by definition it's too wet to be tilling uh, basically if it's too wet to plant it's too wet to till during that springtime period and it's not so much for i mean you, you'll get the compaction from the the down pressure as it goes through the field and doing the tillage but then also probably the more immediate consequence to that year's crop is if you're just slicking over big clods and then you got to come back again with a secondary tillage uh, uh, option again, a field cultivator to smooth those out, but it's already kind of smear, smeared over. And that's the one insult to compaction that you can do for uh, crop response is a smeared soil on top of uh, a bit of soil compaction. So springtime tillage is, is a, uh, uh, a bit more risky uh, um, on things unless you have the right soil moisture conditions that uh, allow for it.